Venturing into the deep ocean is something that humans are not designed for. Deep waters can be fatal in obvious ways, such as drowning, but they can also kill in less obvious ways, like decompression sickness, oxygen toxicity, or complications arising from nitrogen narcosis. However, as I mentioned in the previous video, these complications don't come solely from the high pressure of the deep sea. They all arise from breathing pressurized air. This is why the deepest recorded scuba dive is only 332 meters, which took 12 minutes to reach and 15 hours to return from. The deepest saturation dive was 701 meters, the maximum depth the humans ever reached outside of a submersible. Diving deeper with current technology becomes excessively dangerous. For reference, many offshore oil fields are located at much greater depths than this, all of which require constant maintenance. The Perdido oil field lies nearly 2,450 meters deep, and the oil rigs there are the deepest in the world. Remotely operated vehicles must be used for the deepest work, which is not without its disadvantages. Even the best ROV operators cannot replace a human on site. Atmospheric diving suits have been invented to try to bridge the gap between saturation divers and ROVs, keeping the person inside at one atmosphere of pressure. But these suits are extremely heavy difficult to maneuver, and can only operate at a maximum depth of around 600 meters. If there were a way to eliminate the limitations that breathing air at great depths imposes on the body, then humans could, in theory, dive much deeper than they currently can. As deep as the deepest oil rigs, perhaps even down to the bottom of the Mariana Trench, but you can't eliminate the need to breathe from the equation, nor can you remove the immense pressure that exists at the ocean floor. What you can eliminate is the need to breathe air. If humans could breathe liquid instead of air, many of the problems that deep sea divers face could be completely eliminated. Although the idea seems crazy, the concept is quite straightforward on the surface. Instead of breathing oxygen-rich air, you would breathe an oxygen-rich liquid. As long as the alveoli in our lungs can exchange enough oxygen, they surprisingly don't care how it gets there. Since liquids can't be compressed in the same way that gases can, as the diver descends with their lungs full of liquid, they won't be exposed to the huge partial pressure changes that occur when the lungs are filled with gas. As I mentioned in the previous video, when breathing normal air under pressure, each breath taken contains many more molecules of oxygen and nitrogen than a breath taken at the surface due to the increased pressure. And under pressure, more and more nitrogen builds up in the body's tissues. This becomes a problem when the diver ascends, and the nitrogen comes out of solution and forms dangerous bubbles, causing the condition known as the bends. But with liquid in the lungs instead of air, the body would not become saturated with nitrogen at all. Decompression sickness, and the long decompression times needed to avoid it, could theoretically be completely eliminated. Nitrogen narcosis could also be avoided, and oxygen toxicity would not be an issue, as the level of oxygen delivered to the lungs and the body would remain constant but theoretically is the key phrase here. Everything sounds good on paper, but can it actually work in real life? It's been part of the sci-fi world for a long time, notably in James Cameron's movie The Abyss, where it plays a central role. But ultimately, it's just a special effect, right? Well, for humans, it is, but for the rat, it's not a special effect. It's actually breathing liquid. So if the rat can do it, can we? How far from reality is this? The idea of liquid breathing has existed since the 1960s when it was first studied by the Office of Naval Research to try to increase the escape depth from submarines. Scientists immersed mice in oxygenated saline at pressures of up to 160 atmospheres, which is the pressure one mile deep. Depending on the pressure, temperature, and composition of the breathing medium, the mice could survive for several minutes and sometimes up to several hours breathing liquid. Therefore, the concept of liquid breathing was proven in a way but something continued to kill the mice. They didn't die from a lack of oxygen, as you might assume, but from excessive carbon dioxide buildup in their bodies. Respiratory acidosis is the condition that occurs when the lungs cannot remove enough carbon dioxide produced by the body. The oxygenated saline solutions didn't allow enough CO2 to dissolve into them from the lungs, ultimately killing the mice. This brings us to the first major challenge of liquid breathing. To try to solve this problem, scientists knew they needed to find a liquid medium that could dissolve large amounts of both oxygen and CO2. Very few liquids have this property, except for silicone oils and perfluorocarbons, or PFCs. After further experiments with mice, 
it was found that silicone oils were toxic to the body. Only PFCs remained as a possible solution to the CO2 problem. PFCs are a type of synthetic liquid, a hydrocarbon in which hydrogen's been replaced by fluorine. They're clear and odorless, and chemically and biologically inert. Moreover, they're excellent at carrying oxygen and CO2. Chemically, PFCs are an ideal medium for transporting respiratory gases, but physically, using them to breathe remains extremely difficult in reality, which leads us to the second major hurdle of liquid breathing. Although they transport oxygen and CO2 well, PFCs have nearly twice the density of water, making it much more difficult to inhale and exhale than air. The lungs and diaphragm did not evolve to move that much mass in and out. The average lung capacity of a man is 6 liters, and the average density of PFCs is 1.9 grams per milliliter, meaning the diaphragm would need to move around 12 kilograms of mass per liter. So, while the PFC medium can dissolve a large amount of oxygen and CO2, moving enough liquid in and out to meet the body's needs becomes nearly impossible. The buildup of CO2 would still pose a dangerous problem, especially under any kind of exertion. But determined to continue the experiments, the Office of Naval Research decided that the research had progressed to the point of testing it on the first commercial diver. However, while this was an important milestone, this human trial was not a resounding success. Lying on an operating table, the diver inhaled well-oxygenated liquid and was indeed able to breathe. But afterwards, he developed pneumonia because they failed to remove all the liquid from his lungs. This is the third major problem with liquid breathing. Transitioning back to breathing air after having breathed liquid can be problematic or even fatal if all the liquid is not removed. While all these obstacles should be enough to discourage most research, some scientists and innovators are still trying to find a way to make liquid breathing for deep sea diving a reality. One inventor believes he's come up with a plan to make it possible. He proposes using a compressible chest plate that would mechanically force the liquid in and out of the lungs, along with the CO2 scrubbing device. This device would remove blood from the body through a catheter inserted into the femoral vein in the groin. Then, it would circulate the blood through an artificial gill that would use soda lime to absorb the CO2 before returning the blood to the body. So, in theory, the risk of respiratory acidosis could be eliminated, allowing divers to exert themselves and work for long periods under the sea. But if having a machine that forces liquid in and out of your lungs by crushing your rib cage, along with tubes coming out of your arteries, doesn't sound bad enough, there's still the final and perhaps most horrifying part of the entire process. The idea of breathing liquid, actually inhaling it. You put on the helmet, it fills with liquid, and then you have to drown in it. Even if you rationally know it'll be okay, convincing your brainstem of that fact is a monumental task. Every instinct you have will scream at you not to inhale it. It'll feel exactly the same as regular drowning, except in the final moment, in the last desperate gasp, you just don't die. No thank you. It's hard to imagine any amount of training that could allow you to overcome the instinct of sheer panic. With all these hurdles, both biological and psychological, it seems that liquid breathing for deep sea diving is likely to remain a dream. However, all the research that's been done has not been in vain. Liquid breathing, or liquid ventilation as it's called in the medical field, has enormous potential to treat people with a variety of lung problems. Premature babies, particularly those born before 28 weeks, can have enormous difficulties breathing, often because their lungs have not developed enough to transition from the liquid environment of the womb to breathing air in gas form. Their underdeveloped alveoli lack vital surfactants, which prevent the air sacs from sticking together when we exhale. To combat this, doctors have begun to use PFCs with remarkable success. PFCs can act as a temporary surfactant, facilitating gas exchange and giving the lungs time to finish developing. The technique is also being tested in adults with lung injuries and as a drug delivery mechanism for people with COPD or cystic fibrosis. The medical applications of liquid ventilation will help save countless lives. And as this research progresses, if an even better oxygen and CO2 carrier than PFCs is discovered, perhaps liquid breathing will one day take people to the bottom of the sea after all.